we are specially organizing this for the medium and small companies to help them understand the CSR legislation and also provide them with a solution to help facilitate their CSR. We do understand that for SME sector issues are many. They range from resource constraint in terms of finance and manpower to developing feasible projects, keeping in mind profit variability to identifying suitable NGO partners. Through today's webinar, our expert, Mr. Sachin Joshi, Director, CII ITC Center of Excellence on Sustainable Development, he will walk you through the CSR clause and the rules, what are the do's and don'ts, key features from which the companies need to keep in check, financial aspects, and how you develop projects, and how CII Foundation can play a role. In the second part of the webinar, Mr. Hemant Gupta, Managing Director and CEO of BAC Samman, uh, shall present a user-friendly platform called Samman, which has been jointly developed by CII, the Bombay Stock Exchange, and the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, and uh, the Samman platform, it basically lists development projects offered by authenticated NGOs, which companies can then adopt as part of their CSR. So now we begin with Sachin first. Over to you, Sachin. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Sachin uh, Joshi. I am uh, with the CIITC Center of Excellence for Sustainable Development. Uh, and within CII, we work uh, very closely with uh, uh, CII's National uh, Committee on CSR as well as CII Foundation to help our members uh, uh, improve their CSR uh, practices. Um, so today, um, I'm going to uh, uh, share with you, uh, you know, what are the necessary requirements of uh, the CSR legislation. Uh, it's been three financial years uh, already since the legislation came into force. Uh, and uh, so the dust has uh, settled, uh, but through our experience of interacting with the companies, uh, we do realize that there are still a uh, few gray areas. Um, and so feel free uh, to uh, pose your questions uh, because that will be very important um, for your own understanding of uh, the various requirements of the legislation. So just to give you uh, a, a very quick idea of what uh, our Center of Excellence for Sustainable Development does. Uh, so we primarily help uh, companies to become sustainable organizations from economic governance, environmental and social perspectives. And uh, the whole idea is that as businesses we are able to uh, improve the value that we create for the various stakeholders um, and, and increase our mandate uh, beyond shareholder value creation. Uh, and this uh, we do uh, through a variety of uh, uh, capacity building, consulting, advisory, and policy uh, advocacy interventions, which are related to management systems, transparency and disclosures, uh, measuring social and natural capital. Um, and we also do uh, have a couple of recognitions, uh, such as the System Ready Awards and Sustainable Plus, which is the only and the world's first corporate sustainability label. Uh, specific to uh, today's topic in the sustainability awards, uh, while it is uh, very comprehensive and covers all aspects of, of running a business, uh, we also have a specific focus on CSR, uh, which is a Domain Excellence Award. And the System Ready Award for 2017 is being announced tomorrow. Uh, so do uh, uh, go back to our website, which is sustainabledevelopment.in, uh, um, and just in case you are interested in participating uh, in the 2017 cycle. OK, uh, so uh, uh, some of the basic uh, First, 
so which are the uh, companies uh, that actually qualify for uh, CSR uh, legislation and which are the ones that have to comply. Uh, so first thing first is that if your uh, business uh, has a net worth of rupees 500 crores or a turnover of 1000 crores or a net profit of 5 crores, so it has to be uh, one of these three financial uh, criteria and if the profits are made in India and directly by the company, uh, then uh, the company is uh, supposed to comply with Section 135 of the Companies Act 2013, which otherwise is known as uh, the CSR uh, legislation. Now this, uh, now which are the types of company? Uh, so any company that is incorporated in India, whether it is a domestic company or whether it is a subsidiary of a foreign company. Uh, the company could be a privately held company, it could also be a public uh, listed company, it could be a state-owned enterprise, uh, so uh, there is uh, no a difference in terms of the ownership of uh, the entity. Now once uh, the company meets one of these three financial criteria, the first thing it is supposed to do is to uh, create a CSR committee which is at a board level. And I will come to the CSR committee in a bit. Uh, but one of the things that it has to, as a result of that, what it also has to do is that it needs to then develop a CSR policy and this CSR policy has to be uh, approved by uh, the board and it should necessarily be uploaded on the company's website. If you don't have a company website, it is all right, you don't have to create a separate website only to host the CSR policy. The other mandate of the CSR committee is to ensure uh, that uh, the company every year implements the CSR policy and the activities that are identified in the CSR policy are as per the Schedule 7 uh, to the Section 135 of the Companies Act. Uh, I will come back to uh, some of the ingredients of the CSR policy and what are these uh, elements of Schedule 7. And then uh, finally, uh, the, the CSR committee has to ensure that the company spends at least 2% of its uh, average of the past three, uh, average of the net profit of the past three financial years uh, in CSR. Um, now here the thing, this is very important to understand. Contrary to the popular perception that Section 135 mandates companies to spend at least 2%, uh, it is not exactly correct. The thing is that if a company uh, is not able to spend at least 2%, so which means that it is uh, it has spent uh, under 2%, then it has the opportunity to disclose the reasons for the unspent amount uh, in the director's report. And these reasons have to be approved by the board of the company. Uh, so, which means that, uh, you know, there is a scope for not spending up to 2%, but it is important uh, to mention the reasons in the director's report, otherwise it is a non-compliance issue. Okay, now, uh, uh, what is the CSR committee all about? The CSR committee needs to have at least three uh, members from the board of which one has to be an independent director. Now just in case uh, your company uh, is structured in such a way uh, that uh, you know you only have two members in the board, uh, then it is alright 
to you know therefore not have more than uh, those two directors in the CSR committee. Also, if your board does not have an independent director, then it is all right to not actually ha recruit an independent director, especially for the CSR committee. It is okay uh, that the CSR committee does not have an independent director because by the constitution of your board, according to the Companies Act, you are not required to have an independent director. But then uh, all the three uh, members still need to be uh, the board members. Uh, the job of the CSR committee is to formulate and recommend a CSR policy to the board. Uh, the CSR uh, policy uh, should uh, identify what are the activities uh, that the company will focus on and uh, the CSR committee will then also monitor uh, the implementation uh, of the CSR uh, activities uh, identified during the year and uh, disclose the CSR spend uh, in the director's report. So these are, uh, you know, uh, this is what the, the section 135 is about. Then there are, in order to implement the section 135, uh, there will be, uh, uh, there are a set of rules so that uh, so that the companies understand you know these uh, five requirements of the section 135 and and you know I will try to cover uh, the main portions of the CSR rules okay now this is schedule 7 uh, actually if you look at the schedule 7 it is fairly uh, 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 detailed in terms of every area. Uh, what you see here are only the key words. Uh, so for instance, uh, one is on education which includes all types of education. So primary education, higher education, uh, adult literacy, uh, uh, skills development, uh, vocational skills. Uh, so all of that it, you know, is, 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 is in education and skills development. Then you have uh, gender equality, women empowerment, uh, anything to do with a girl child as well, uh, you know, which you can't fit under education or you can't uh, fit under health. Uh, all of that would come under uh, gender equality and women empowerment. Then you have hunger, uh, malnutrition, undernutrition, uh, poverty uh, alleviation uh, uh, programs, all of that uh, is is the next one in hunger and malnutrition or undernutrition uh, you would also include health uh, which is also so for instance you know sponsoring uh, or, or supporting uh, medical health camps uh, ambulances hospitals uh, all of that is included in that then uh, supporting uh, uh, work on national heritage, art and culture. So when we have uh, monuments which are identified by Archaeological Survey of India, uh, so any any uh, monument which is uh, listed in as a national heritage then, and if there is any support going to that, that would qualify as a national heritage. And then there are arts and cultures, which could be music, which would be, can be crafts, uh, handicrafts. Uh, all of that could all, also uh, becomes a part of uh, language, uh, dialects. Uh, all of that is part of nat national heritage, art and culture. Uh, in India, there is also a lot of traditional knowledge, which is uh, uh, which remains with say you know specific tribal communities and so if you if, if there is any activity which is related to preserving uh, some of those uh, you know uh, traditional knowledge uh, that would also become part of a CSR. Anything that you do with army veterans basically army is not just limited to army it is all the armed forces so it includes Navy, Air Force, paramilitary forces uh, anything to do with uh, the veterans 
or their uh, the family members, especially you know widows um, and uh, dependable children. Uh, all of that is included in uh, uh, army veterans and um, any support that goes to armed forces. Uh, this would also include, so one of the, uh, the challenges that the, uh, especially the soldiers who, who retire at a, a fairly young age from the armed forces, to rehabilitate them uh, in the mainstream uh, is quite a big challenge uh, because the skill sets that they have acquired while in, in, in training and service uh, it is actually uh, very specific and many times it is not uh, useful in, in a lot of uh, other mainstream economic activities. And so any, any uh, rehabilitation, any skill uh, empowerment that you do of these soldiers is also included uh, in, uh, in, in the support. Anything to do with environment and uh, conservation, uh, restoration of ecology, uh, which would mean uh, plantations, uh, water bodies, uh, which, are, which are public assets, uh, uh, public parks in rural or urban areas, all of that uh, would broadly be included in environment. It's, it's, it's virtually everything under the sun. Uh, sports promotion, here it is important to understand that the sports that uh, businesses support are Olympic sports or Paralympic sports or uh, sports uh, identified by the National Sports Authority. Uh, Paralympic sports are the ones where differently abled people uh, compete in, in, in national or international sports. Uh, Kabaddi is, is, is one of the sports which is uh, a national sport. It is played at an international level but only by limited countries, say for instance India, Pakistan, Iran, uh, you know, uh, uh, countries in this geography. Uh, uh, it is, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think it is still a part of the Olympic sports. Uh, but it is played in, in Commonwealth Games and uh, Asian Games. So that would qualify. Gilidanda is still not uh, uh, you know, a sport that falls into any one of those categories. So uh, that is, you know, supporting a Gilidanda match in a rural area may not qualify for CSR activity. A rural development is uh, pretty much rural development. Again, everything under the sun, uh, anything uh, that businesses do in, in the rural areas. Now here it is important to understand that in India, uh, we do not define rural areas. Uh, we only define urban areas. So anything that is not an urban area automatically becomes an urban, uh, becomes a rural area. And therefore, uh, any infrastructure work, any uh, quality of life work, any skills development work uh, that you do in the rural areas uh, would qualify in rural development. Then uh, there is uh, technology incubation. Here, if you are supporting uh, technology uh, incubation centers uh, or any technology which is being developed by institutions that are uh, identified uh, or, or uh, are, uh, uh, recognized by uh, uh, UGC, um, they are the ones that would qualify here. So for instance, if in, in one of the IITs uh, or equivalent institutes if there is a technology which is being developed or there is a technology incubation center and you are supporting that, uh, then it would qualify uh, for technology incubation. Uh, you have to be very clear that uh, the institute that you are working with is uh, eligible for uh, to be recognized as a recipient in the uh, in, in, in CSR and, and therefore it is a recognized institute by the government of India. Uh, 
And finally, PM's Relief Fund. Uh, here it is only PM's Relief Fund. Contributions to CM's Relief Fund is not permissible. Uh, I mean, you, you are still free to uh, contribute to CM's Relief Fund, but you cannot put that uh, money as part of your calculation of 2% spend. It's only PM's Relief Fund. Uh, so this is uh, largely uh, the Schedule 7, uh, the way it was originally uh, structured. And uh, since then, uh, from time to time, uh, the Government of India has added few more areas uh, by way of clarifications or by way of making uh, some additions. So for instance, uh, housing for economically uh, weaker sections of the society, uh, slum area development and skills India were already part of areas such as poverty, uh, rural development, uh, education and vocational skills. Um, but because you know there were a few clarifications which, which were sought out uh, or there were uh, you know the, uh, in the Indian government uh, you know, launched a, a focused intervention uh, on skills uh, mission. Uh, so that's where there has been, you know, the specific mention of these areas. Uh, however, uh, there were two more uh, funds which were created. One is the Swachh Bharat Kosh and there is the Clean Ganga Mission uh, Fund. Now, uh, the difference here is that um, these are only funds, so uh, uh, it it works uh, like you know it's these funds rest with the with the central government, and uh, you just have to uh, uh, give your cut a check and give your money uh, there, and it is up to them to utilize the money. Uh, what we have found interestingly is that in the three financial years that have passed. Uh, uh, the companies are not very uh, have not been very enthusiastic in in just giving away money to the PM's relief fund, Swachh Bharat Kosh, or the Clean Ganga uh, fund. Uh, they, the the companies actually prefer to spend the money uh, rather than giving it to uh, one of these funds. So this has been the trend that we have been seeing in the three financial years. Now uh, let me come back to the CSR committee uh, 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 because this is a very key compliance uh, area. Uh, so it is very important to understand uh, and and you know uh, ensure that uh, there is no uh, you know scope for non-compliance. Uh, so as I had mentioned, uh, there should be at least three members uh, in the CSR committee, including one uh, independent director. Uh, the uh, you can have a CSR committee uh, with more than one uh, independent director. You can have a CSR committee with, with where you know all the three members are independent directors. The choice is completely yours. You could also have a CSR committee with more than three members. So all that the 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 legislation requires is that it should have at least three members with at least one independent director. Who chairs the CSR committee? Again, it's entirely uh, the board's decision. Just the way when you have an audit committee, the risk management committee, the stakeholder relations committee, uh, nominations and remunerations committee, and how you, or who, who chairs that uh, committee is, is entirely the board's decision. Similarly for the CSR committee also it is the board's decision. So it could be the promoter who is uh, chairing it, uh, it could also be the non-promoter uh, CEO or the managing director of the company, it could also be an independent director, uh, the choice is entirely yours. Uh, the ent entities that, uh, uh, that are not required to have independent director on board uh, shall constitute the CSR committee without such a director. Uh, this is just a repetition of what I had said earlier. And similarly, uh, the private company with only two directors on it board uh, is 
you know, it is all right for them to have only those two directors on the CSR committee. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to just increase the size of your board uh, to have three members in the CSR committee. Now, uh, some of the accounting matters uh, which are also important to understand. Now, most of your CSR uh, spends uh, will be uh, operating expenditure, not capital expenditure. Uh, so even if, so f let me illustrate a couple of differences here. Uh, say if you, uh, if, if there's a company that is uh, supporting a school and it has spent the money in constructing the building, uh, the ownership of that building, um, uh, so what I was mentioning is that most of your CSR expense will be of uh, operating expenditure or revenue expenditure and not capital expenditure. It, they will be classified as capi capital expenditure only if the, as, uh, the spend was to create an asset which is in turn owned by your company and in that case then that asset would also uh, uh, add to the balance sheet uh, on the asset side. Otherwise, it is all going to be revenue revenue expenditure. If it is everything is revenue expenditure, then there will be nothing on the balance sheet. Everything will go into the profit and loss account. Depreciation is not uh, a part of a CSR spend. Uh, so whatever depreciation uh, that the company uh, benefits from cannot be included as part of the 2% calculation of the CSR spend. Uh, when you reflect the CSR spend in the profit and loss statement, uh, explain it a little bit in the notes to the PNL statement. Uh, there are two ways of uh, putting uh, it in the PNL statement. Uh, you can create a separate uh, head uh, called CSR or it can just go in, uh, you know, whatever was the type of the spend uh, and then accordingly put it on in the uh, expense head. Uh, what we have seen by looking at the, the financial statements of, uh, you know, uh, close to 1500 companies in the last uh, two financial years for which the, the reports have been out is that companies uh, put it in the natural heads and they don't create a separate head under CSR. Uh, once again, this is a very important point. Whenever the spend is less than 2%, please do not miss in providing a reason for the shortfall. So if your spend was supposed to be 100% uh, after the 2% calculation and you have spent say 95 rupees, then for the 5% shortfall, uh, please give an explanation. Now, uh, a, a usual question that the companies have is that what type of uh, justification is acceptable and what type of justification is not acceptable. This is again left to the CSR company. Uh, committee and the, the board at large uh, try to be as uh, genuine as possible. Don't try to, uh, you know, uh, come up with reasons which are not real uh, because the regulator is completely within its rights to ask for explanations uh, when they do random check of the director's reports that the companies have filed. So, uh, Try to be as genuine as possible in explaining your rationale. The rationals could be uh, that you know you did not find uh, you know a, a worthy project. You did not find a good implementing agency. The implementation of the project got delayed, and therefore you could not spend the money uh, as it was budgeted. Uh, uh, it could also be that you know your business might suddenly uh, you know go wrong during the financial year and you need the scarce resources that you have and during 
in the course of the year you make uh, a decision that uh, you would uh, you know rather spend that money to survive um, and and uh, not run out of business uh, contractual liability uh, is allowed as per the usual accounting standards and now here uh, but there is no provisioning uh, which also uh, takes me to the next point that when you have uh, you know unspent money uh, it is completely left to the company to decide uh, what to do with that money uh, you may want to spend it to the next year uh, or else just forget it uh, so it's entirely your decision uh, it cannot be uh, you know there is no provision uh, as per the accounting standards uh, the only provisioning can happen is that where you already have a contractual liability. For instance, when the work has been delivered by an implementing agency and the invoice has already been raised uh, and you are therefore you have a contractual liability to make the payment uh, and, and uh, that you can uh, show as a liability. Just a little bit of uh, more information here. Uh, the the Chartered Accounting Institute had released a guidance uh, on the accounting uh, principles for CSR spend. So, uh, and it is available on their website, ICAI's website. So you can uh, always visit that. But if you don't find it, uh, we are happy to uh, share it with you. Okay, what cannot be included in 2% CSR? Any CSR activity that happens in outside India. So for instance, when the Nepal earthquake happened and a lot of Indian companies supported the activities there, uh, you're free to support those kind of activities, but that spend cannot be included in the 2% calculation. Any funds given to the political parties, whether it is a financial transaction or in kind, you cannot put that under 2% spends. Uh, any spends that benefit your own employees and their families, so for instance, any health services that you provide, any education services that you provide, none of those, uh, even uh, the social security that we provide cannot be treated as part of 2% uh, spends. Uh, marketing and branding activities uh, uh, that support any uh, you know social or environmental cause again cannot be treated as CSR. Uh, the uh, any one of sponsorships uh, of events or activities again cannot. It has to be so. One of the conditions of a CSR project uh, activity is that it has to be in a project or a program mode where there is a proper project plan, there is periodic reporting that is happening, uh, monitoring and evaluation also happens. And uh, there is no activity which is a normal course of business. So for instance, if there is, uh, uh, if, if, if you are in the financial services business and you are uh, generating awareness uh, on financial inclusion for some of your stakeholders then uh, by pro uh, which also leads to the promotion of your financial services uh, that is a normal course of business uh, also for instance you know for you have uh, a discharge taking place and you invest in uh, effluent treatment plant uh, that is by law uh, you know and and that is a normal course of business that investment that you make in EDP cannot be treated as part of CSR. Uh, compliance with other legislation, so anything that is falling as a part of labor laws, uh, environmental legislations, uh, any environmental clearance, social clearance that you have, pollution norms, uh, whatever it is, cannot be treated as part of 2% uh, CSR. How can you implement CSR activities? Uh, you can do it yourself directly uh, by the company. Uh, a very simple example here is that if you are supporting construction of toilets, uh, you can uh, develop that project on your own, hire your own contractors, go to the community, uh, pay the contractors directly uh, you know, to construct those toilets. So that is something which is a direct implementation by the company. 
the other is that you could also take help of some implementing agencies. Now these implementing agencies need to uh, either be registered as a society, trust or a Section 8 company. In India there is no legal definition of NGO. Uh, any non-governmental, non-for-profit organization has to be registered uh, either as a society trust or a Section 8 company. A Section 8 company uh, is a not-for-profit company as defined by the Companies Act. Uh, now the, uh, it could also be uh, uh, your own corporate foundation. So as a company you can create your own corporate foundation uh, which is then registered as a society trust or a section 8 company. If it is not your own foundation uh, but it is some other entity then that entity needs to be at least three years old in existence. If it is your own foundation the three-year uh, requirement is not applicable. Uh, and finally uh, if there is an institution which is established by the central or the state government or uh, under an act of the parliament or a state legislature, then the three years requirement is also not applicable. So for instance, if you wanted to work uh, in the legal area and uh, under the Supreme Court, uh, there is a not-for-profit uh, entity which is registered as a, as a, uh, as a society or a trust, and you were supporting uh, that society or a trust uh, to, uh, you know, uh, maybe it is in terms of uh, uh, providing some kind of legal services uh, or handling the cost of legal services for some, uh, you know, types of beneficiaries, then that uh, uh, is, is completely allowed and there the three-year requirement is not applicable. The other way to do it is, and probably you know, for quite a uh, for for uh, this this might be very interesting for uh, you know the companies who are in the value chain or the supply chain of large companies, uh, whether they are domestic large companies or international large companies. You could actually collaborate with other companies uh, and participate in uh, in the, in the CSR activities. Uh, the other way to do it is that if you are part of an industrial uh, zone, uh, SEZ, uh, a cluster uh, or you have a local industry association uh, like you know a Vadodara Chamber of Commerce or you know something like that, then uh, you can you know uh, get together, identify your own projects, uh, contribute to that and then uh, uh, and, and then, but the the uh, only thing that you have to take care of is that when you report your CSR spends in the director's report, you can only report your share of the contribution and not the total uh, budget of that activity. Uh, this is an important uh, amendment that has happened uh, to some of the rules. Uh, there is an, uh, a permissible limit of 5% of the total CSR expenditure. Uh, so that this 5% of 2% that you can use to cover your administrative expenses. Also to build your own capacities on CSR. So for instance, if you were sponsoring you know, your employees to a CSR training program, uh, then that cost can be covered in, in this 5% of 2% or if you have an implementing agency and you wanted to build their capacity that could also be included in this 5% of 2%. Salaries uh, of the CSR staff cannot be considered as part of 2%. There was a time when it was allowed and immediately after three months and, and you know I have mentioned both the dates. So 18 June 2014 it was allowed and up exactly after three months it was uh, uh, withdrawn. So salaries uh, of the regular CSR staff be, cannot be treated as part of uh, CS, 2 person CSR. Uh, let me come to uh, the CSR uh, uh, 
uh, format, disclosure format, this is exactly the way uh, it appears in the legislation also. Uh, in, in the first column is very straightforward with the serial number. The second column is where you identify uh, or mention what is that CSR project or CSR activity. So for instance, if it is, uh, or you have a title to, you know, your CSR project like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just picking up from what is available in the market, uh, say Nanhi Kali or, or, you know, anything like that. Or you just, you know, call it, it as a health intervention or, or supporting, uh, you know, primary education for the girl child that would suffice uh, in column two. The sector in which the project is covered, here you have to pick up the part of the schedule seven and put it here. So for instance, if it was a vocational skills program, you mention here vocational skills. If it is a health intervention, mention health intervention. If you're supporting a technology in, with a, in an incubation center, then mention that here. Column four, uh, is basically to identify and specify what is the geographical area of your intervention. It could be the name of uh, a taluka, it could be a district, it could be a state, you can, and if it is all over the country, you can even mention Pan-India. What was the budgeted amount? Um, it would go in column five. How much did you spend out of that budgeted amount would go in column six. If you spent exactly that same amount, then the amount that would appear in column five and column six would be the same. Uh, it will, and you know, it would be a different column, uh, different uh, financial number if it was more than the budgeted outlay or less than the budgeted outlay. What is important here to identify is that this, uh, this the figure that you may specify in column six, the sp actual spent figure has to be divided into a direct expenditure as well as the overheads. Again, from our two years of analysis of disclosures, what we have found is that companies are actually not providing, uh, a lot of companies are not providing uh, this, this breakup of direct expenditure and the overheads. Uh, and that is a non-compliance issue. Uh, if you have a multi-year uh, project, then the cumulative amount that you have spent uh, up to the reporting uh, period is what would come in the column seven. So for instance, for the disclosures that you would make for the financial year, which is ending, uh, you know, 31st of March, if your project has been going on for three years, the past three years, and every year you have spent 100 rupees on it, uh, then you would actually mention 300 rupees in column seven. If the amount that you would have spent in uh, FY17 is 100 rupees, the amount that you would specify in column six would also be 100 rupees. And if it is the same as the budgeted amount, then column five would also be 100. So then in that case, it would be 100 in column five, 100 in column six, 300 in column seven. Uh, and if it was a project that you started in the current financial year, then the cumulative expenditure would also be 100. Uh, and then finally, in the last column, you mentioned uh, whether the amount that you spent was directly uh, spent directly by you or through an implementing agency. And if it was an implementing agency, uh, then you have to specify the name of the implementing agency. So for instance, if you uh, have spent the money and your implementing agency is CII Foundation, uh, then you mention so-and-so project uh, uh, implemented through a CII Foundation. And finally, and this is also a segue uh, to the next part of uh, the webinar uh, where Hemant from BSC Samman takes over, is basically that you can, uh, and now, now this is very important, particularly for the target audience for this webinar, is that because uh, a lot of the companies are small or mid-sized and they may not have internal capabilities and capacities to conceive, uh, you know, CSR projects and run them in a project or a program mode, uh, develop dedicated human resources for to, for to do all of that and then, you know, monitor and do all of that. 
what you could do is like what I had mentioned there is a scope for taking up joint projects with maybe your large buyer or you know in a cluster or in an industry association or CI foundation has a mandate to even do the project management for you uh, or CI foundation for instance has uh, projects in skills or in sanitation uh, and, and there are other projects maybe you know you can also uh, check with Sarbani uh, later which are the types of uh, initiatives that the foundation has and you can actually support some of those initiatives. Uh, BSC Samman can be a really interesting platform uh, for you uh, to be able to identify uh, a reliable, authentic, credible uh, uh, and legitimate implementing agency. Uh, I don't want to uh, steal Hemant's thunder, uh, but it's a very interesting platform uh, and, and on that note uh, I will conclude. Uh, uh, and hand over to uh, to Sarbani and Hemant. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sachin, uh, for simplifying the legislation for us, clarifying the activities which can and cannot be considered CSR, the compliance and the financial aspect of the legislation. Thank you very much, Sarbani. And thanks a lot, Sachin, for that excellent overview of the, the law and what it entails uh, compliance with the law. Uh, just by way of introduction, um, uh, before we get into some of the details of Saman, uh, Saman was established uh, shortly after the Companies Act 2013 came into force. Uh, it was uh, conceptualized as a joint effort between the Bombay Stock Exchange, CII and IICA. And the formal launch of the product took place in Q1 of 2015 here in Delhi uh, at the Vigyan Bhavan. And the platform, the technology platform, got launched in November of 2015. The, uh, as of date, so it's been a little over a year since uh, we've been in our operation. And as of date, we have over 900 NGOs Pan India that are registered on the platform with approximately 1,000 projects needing about uh, 1,700 crores in funding requirements. Uh, the basic premise behind the platform is, as Sachin was mentioning, to be a platform on which uh, organizations, corporates can find credible NGOs. And the reason why they can find credible NGOs on the platform is that any NGO that gets listed on Samman has to go through a rigorous process of verification. And what happens on Samman is that we also not only list the NGO, but also list uh, the projects that are CSR compliant going back to what uh, Sachin was mentioning. Uh, so we make sure that, for, as an example, that the NGO has been in existence for at least three years, that the projects are supporting the causes that are there in Schedule 7 and so on and so forth, right? So that's a quick background on Saman, where it came from, where we are today. What we'll do next is to actually get into, from your perspective, um, what benefits does a platform like Saman give to you? And as uh, is mentioned on the slide, this was, it's a first of its kind CSR platform that uh, brings together corporates and NGOs. And the, the core concept or the core idea was that we want to be your trusted intermediary in your achieving CSR compliance under, the, under um, Section 135. And the way we do it, is we do it in a number of ways, the first of which I had mentioned earlier, which is we provide you access to credible NGOs and their programs uh, via the platform. We are also um, working with uh, key stakeholders in the CSR ecosystem to build a transparent and measurable environment for corporates and NGOs to work. So going back to uh, something that uh, Sachin had mentioned, um, one of the constraints that uh, the smaller and medium uh, organizations will have is how, mu how much of resource they can put behind a project. 
given that uh, it, uh, if you want to see return on your investment, you do need to monitor and report on, on, on the projects that are happening on the ground. And uh, last but not the least, uh, given that uh, the uh, Act has been around for about three years now, and as Sachin was saying, the dust has started to settle, uh, there are um, intricacies associated with complying with the law, but more practically, how to implement the law effectively. We would like to be helping you in uh, doing that process also. So how does Saman do all of this? Before we get into that, uh, a quick summary. Uh, it is essentially a synopsis of what you heard from Sachin, as well as what our experience has been. Uh, how does Saman, what are the various challenges you will face when you're implementing CSR or as you have been implementing CSR? One, like has been mentioned before, making sure that you find trusted implementation partners or NGOs. Uh, second is that how do you make sure that the programs that you're investing in by these NGOs are CSR compliant? How do you monitor and report uh, on these CSR programs, especially if they're not in your geographical neighborhood uh, of, let's say, your factories or your offices? What happens, and um, you know, there's a concept of social return on investment. How do you measure what impact has your investment in that project created? What, and like they say, if you can't measure, you can't improve. How do you find out what else is happening in the CSR ecosystem? What are the trends? What are the companies doing? Uh, what is a good place for you to be in? And again, going back to what uh, Sachin had mentioned, that it's also important for you to be able to work not just on your own project, but also on collaborative projects, because that will give you much more bang for the buck uh, or leverage the uh, investments of not just your organizations, but other organizations also, and achieve a larger social impact. And of course, Last but not the least, uh, some of the stuff that Sachin covered, which is related to the CSR law and the compliance to it and the various interpretations. Also keeping in mind that the law has been amended since it was uh, introduced in 2013 and making sure that you keep up to speed with what's happening on the CSR uh, law side. So just uh, listing out uh, the one that is implicit in all this, uh, all these challenges is the fact uh, what uh, what Sachin had mentioned earlier and Sarbani also is that how to make it as resource efficient for you as possible so that from your organization perspective you minimize the resources you have to commit but at the same time maximize the impact that you want to achieve. Just a, a pictorial depiction on the screen of uh, the way the CSR marketplace looks today with a large number of players, uh, including corporates, um, donors, private high net worth donors. Yeah, there is an uh, increasing amount of employee engagement and volunteering that is happening. We have NGOs and foundations that work as implementation partners, but we also have self-executed programs that companies, corporates often engage in. So, and it, it, the interaction between all these entities today doesn't have the streamlined flow that you as corporates would be uh, you know, experiencing in your own internal processes, perhaps being more comfortable with that. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there is lack of transparency and benchmarks in the space uh, so far, although things are improving. Uh, as the space matures. <clears throat> so, um, given everything that we spoke about, the challenges, the state of play, how does Saman uh, come into the picture? Uh, so, the, some, like I was saying earlier, Saman was conceptualized as a platform that will help you 
do uh, do your CSR more effectively and more easily. So in order to address the above issues, uh, BSC along with IIC and CII build a CSI knowledge platform. Like I mentioned, it got launched in November 2015. And it allows you to uh, find validated programs and projects anywhere and uh, anywhere in India under the ambit of uh, Schedule 7 of the Companies Act. Um, and I'd like to stress the fact that this is pan-India, so we are not uh, centered around either the north or the west, but we cover as most of the country as possible. And we're constantly looking for new uh, accredited NGOs uh, where we, we find the coverage to be weak. Also, as a part of the platform, uh, what you'll get is uh, you know, the projects that you have invested in, the NGOs in a very, using a very standard format would upload their updates to the status of the project and that you can monitor sitting in one place rather than getting multiple reports from multiple partners. And going back to what Sachin had mentioned towards the end of his presentation, uh, also promoting collaboration and sharing best, best practices. So that at a high level uh, is what uh, Saman can offer you. And just getting into a little bit more detail on what had been mentioned in the previous slide, we at Saman try to provide you with uh, support that is as much as cradle to grave as possible, addressing the full CSR life cycle. Uh, so right from the, the beginning of providing training and capacity building of corporates and CSR. And the way we are implementing each of these life stages of the life cycle is we are engaging with some of the best uh, stakeholders in the Indian in, uh, CSR ecosystem, like I'd mentioned earlier. And uh, we are organizing, as an example, uh, training and capacity building workshops across India on CSR for corporates. And that schedule has already been released for the first three workshops. And if you would like to know more about these workshops, do drop me an email. Uh, uh, my email was given in the title slide. I would be happy to share information on that. We are, uh, as a, uh, given that we do have a platform where CSR uh, activities from corporates are recorded, we do have the capability of providing uh, sector-wise information uh, for CSR activities. The caveat here being that we are, of course, restricted to the activities that have been recorded on Samman. So, uh, and that is why when uh, co companies register on Samman, I encourage them to record as much of their CSR activities as possible on Samman. It brings greater transparency and better reporting on what's happening in the Indian CSR ecosystem. The, uh, the point about collaborations and joint products, uh, we do provide CSR partnership opportunities on both the corporate side and NGO, NGO side. And one of the ways we actually do this is uh, we also act as a, a platform that is capable of broadcasting any projects a corporate may want to take where it's looking for either uh, NGOs or other corporate entities that can work together in partnership and uh, that can work as a very effective way of bringing together like-minded corporates and NGOs. Um, we also believe that uh, in order for us to have a collaborative space that is uh, transparent and achieves the expectations each of the stakeholders have, it's very important that everybody speaks the same language. And if I were to go back to that uh, chart that had depicted all the various entities, as of today, uh, most of the CSR projects tend to be one-on-one -on -one projects, not all, most of them. And therefore, for the donor and for the recipient who are talking one-to-one, -one, it is easier to establish expectations and communication mechanisms. But the moment you open up and start doing collaborative where you have multiple corporates, multiple donors, and multiple NGOs or multiple recipients, then that ease of communication becomes harder because each person has different expectations, different communication styles. And there it's critical 
that you have standard reporting and standard monitoring practices and standard impact assessment. And we are actively at BSC Saman promoting uh, adoption of such uh, monitoring and reporting standards. And last but not the least, uh, given that we have projects on our platform that are CSR compliant, whatever investments you do that are recorded on some BSC Saman, we also provide certificates for to the corporates of their CSR investments. So that, in brief, was a quick uh, update on BSC Saman, on where we are, what we do, some of the plans we have. Our URL is given, uh, it's www.bscsaman.com. And then uh, my email address, just to go back to the first slide, is heman.gupta at bscindia.com. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sharbani, for providing me this opportunity. Over to you.